So um, there's a draft of um, a first draft of a legislative proposal for research in your um, uh, meeting materials. It's called the draft legislative proposal for research, and I'll just go through and then love your comments. So there's a little bit of background um, about the need for research that I'm guessing we're all on the same page about. Um, the goals of this, um, basically what we proposed was that the state of Oregon establish a center, a cannabis research center devoted to advancing science related to the health effects of cannabis commission, I'm sorry, cannabis consumption. Um, and the goals are laid out in part two. Um, the CRC, as I call it, um, would develop lines of inquiry within three general priority areas. Those are, uh, those are the ones outlined in House Bill 2198. Um, and then within those broad areas, we outlined a number of priority topics. Um, and those were well outlined in the report of the task force um, established by Senate Bill 844. Um, so they fall along the five general areas of research, um, basic plant and agricultural research, public health research, observational studies uh, related to the medical benefits of cannabis, preclinical research, and clinical research. Um, the way that we conceived the structure was that this would be a collaboration across academic institutions um, and in conjunction with the Oregon Health Authority. Um, thought that this such a uh, research center would probably best house at Oregon Health and Science University because it is focused on um, the effects of, uh, uh, the health effects on patients. Um, and uh, but we did think there could be potential co-leadership by OHSU and Oregon State University. Um, and then we thought this could be a nice uh, place to coordinate the research by uh, a large number of member investigators who have established experience in cannabis research uh, that's highly relevant to public health and medical care. Um, the funding section is the most sketchy. Um, this, I would say, uh, you know, you just sort of feel free to be aspirational when you're first putting these things together. But I say that these aren't numbers that are out of the sky. We um, received input from established cannabis research centers, including uh, the one based at University uh, of uh, California and San Diego, and also um, from the Public Health Department of Colorado, which has administered three separate grant programs, um, all between nine and $10 million. Um, the one, uh, the Cannabis Research Center that's been around for about 20 years at UCSD was also established by initial funds of about $10 million. And it just seems like that is the magic number um, kind of a robust initial research program that is able to support itself administratively and create enough pilot research um, that it can then use that pilot research to be competitive uh, for external grants. Um, there are plenty of cannabis research centers that have risen and failed quickly um, for a number of reasons. I think most of it is like a poor sustainability plan um, so, and um, an insufficient funding so that it was vulnerable to um, political forces that discourage research in this area. So um, we're still uh, receiving input from cannabis research centers around the program. Um, but this was kind of like the initial best guess for what would create a viable program that could really do the kind of cutting edge research that Oregon um, would like to do um, to make a difference for our patients. Um, I think, you know, we talked, I attended um, Anthony's subcommittee, and we talked a lot about the challenges of funding this, um, but I think what we agreed upon was that um, having funds from a, from the OMP program that went directly to something that support that benefited patients like medical research um, felt a lot better than having funds that went to things unrelated to the program or to patients. So um, it just seems like this would be more a more uh, palatable option. But where exactly those funds come from uh, is uh, open for discussion. Um, but this is one that is, is going to require um, a clear financial task. And, uh, and that can be hard, I think, was probably the death of the last round of, um, of recommendations in this route. Uh, I feel like you're reaching for your microphone, Jesse. I'm waiting patiently, so it's not to interrupt. Okay, <laughs> should I continue or do you want to insert? Ahead. Okay. Um, we had like, a, lot of, a lot of specific thoughts about grant administration. This may be more detailed than needed, but we just thought we'd lay it out here. Um, again, this is also based on the experience of other states in establishing a research program. Um, and uh, and what we thought made most sense um, and could start small and be scaled up if the research center initially um, supported uh, a number of both internal and external grants, which would be awarded through um, 
a rigorous peer, uh, competitive peer review process similar to an NIH grant program um, with um, key input from the Oregon Health Authority. That way uh, we could make sure that the research that we do is both um, high priority from a public health and medical perspective, um, also very focused on the health and safety specifically of Oregonians, um, and, uh, and that it would really support best practices and policies for the OMMP. Um, so, uh, you know, there, every state has kind of handled it different, like who those grants go to, who's eligible for those grants, do they have to go to investigators in Oregon? Um, there's kind of like a whole side note on, um, on why it might make sense to sometimes award those grants to people outside the state of Oregon if they bring in necessary expertise or allow us to um, build up a critical mass of patients who have rare conditions um, and it would be impossible to get um, a good sample size simply by restricting research within our state. So, Unfortunately, there are people that have gone before us who have uh, kind of learned the hard way about how to administer those grants and we're trying to take cues from them. Um, I think oversight will be an important component of such a center. Um, there are a lot of people who to contribute to medical marijuana research, including um, people from the industry and even just uh, private patient, private people. And I think um, there should be ways to receive those funds but also ensure that the research that we do is free from undue influence that would compromise um, the um, the uh, validity of the findings. Um, there are many, many functions of such a center, and I have to say, although these are kind of thrown into um, other, just like long um, laundry list in part six, I would say some of these things um, overlap with education um, and also um, actually with every other subcommittee, um, because what we're proposing is that this center could look really rigorously at any innovations proposed by the other subcommittees and give us a sense um, on a policy level as to whether we're taking the right direction, if the things that we're doing, say we implement statewide training, is that training effective? How is it actually changing the lives of our patients? Um, is it, you know, or should we head in another direction? Same thing for product integrity. There's lots of questions um, and, uh, and diversion, um, and, uh, and certainly for patient access. Are the interventions we're doing actually representing the needs of uh, patients in Oregon? Um, are they effective? How, do, how are they optimized? Everything that we do is subject to scrutiny. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we had a body of researchers with expertise in this area? Um, I think also, as we discussed in our research subcommittee a ton, um, Katrina, um, we talked a lot about the, the inherent challenges of this kind of research, of, uh, given its, uh, particularly given its, um, its Schedule One designation federally. Um, we had uh, Dr. Colin Roberts here on Friday um, talking about how he's navigated some of those. It was super interesting. Um, remains a challenge, but um, he was a good model. He's a, um, a pediatric neurologist at OHSU who is studying um, cannabis in his uh, patients, young patients with epilepsy through industry-funded survey, uh, industry-funded research projects, and uh, he's got his schedule, license, schedule one license and navigated some of these things that are really tough. And um, there are clearly a lot of common lessons learned that if you had a center, um, you could simply educate all of your uh, researchers in a pretty efficient way and make them all um, much uh, more skilled in navigating those barriers so that we can get really um, to the kind of uh, clinical bedside research that will make a, um, you know, that will make a huge difference um, in the way that uh, we're able to administer medical care. So anyway, um, uh, I can let you read all that at your, at your leisure. Uh, we just thought that such a center would be, um, it's timely, um, it's its actually beyond time for such a center, um, and I think it could serve a lot of functions for the state. So I'm really open to feedback. Yeah, so just to add a little bit, one of the things that this, um, the subcommittee that we did look at is, of course, we were talking about Senate Bill 844, which did a pretty a rigorous look at what data were available, and there's since been the National Academy of Sciences <clears throat> had put together the, um, I can't remember what it's called, but the medical <laughs> aspects of cannabis and cannabinoids or whatever. Um, and so less about those details. Just a review, yeah. Right, and, and really instead to focus less on the content and more on, so what structure would we need? So we had done a little bit of that at 844, but that was really kind of the focus. Um, the focus of the group was, was this administrative. So we didn't want to rehash the details of what, what's known and what's not and what are the areas of focus, et cetera. But really, the reason this hasn't gotten off the ground is we don't have an administrative structure, um, whether it's an institute or a ton of universities or grant funds or whatever, to launch this thing. So that, that's really the barrier. 
Totally. And the, the, when A41 First Task Force came out with its recommendation, they actually recommended a, a freestanding institute. And I think that made sense for a lot of reasons. It can kind of help you navigate the chronic fears that academic or institutions have about whether or not they can bring this research into their fold and still be eligible for federal grants, um, especially with like, the ups and downs of um, political cycles. Um, but I think part of us wanting to make this more feasible um, was actually housing this at an academic institution this time because the infrastructure is there, um, the investigators are there. Um, it's actually a much less ambitious ask this time, um, and we're really trying to, I think, I think we're, we're really trying to um, make this as feasible and doable as possible. Um, so hopefully we can get some energy and excitement around this, this type of proposal. I think this is a great proposal, although I do have some concerns over the funding. Uh, funding is, of course, a challenge. My particular concern is the proposal that this be funded out of OMMP fees. Um, we just had a pretty robust discussion on what's the right number of patients to be in the medical system. Um, those are the patients that generate the fees. Uh, I think there's going to be a a lot of diversity of opinion on this commission about what the right number of patients are. Um, you know, I would posit that if we accomplish our objective of achieving regulatory oversight, the number of patients could fall dramatically as a result. Uh, so, you know, keeping that in mind, it, it seems like a particularly volatile funding source. Well, I'm very happy to receive funds for the recreational room. <laughs> yeah. But I think I was told early on that that would be an unwelcome suggestion as well. So, so uh, I'm well, open to any suggestions. Well, I mean, okay. the way the recreational program works is we don't have any funds. Um, we're fee funded um, off of our license fees. Uh, and those go 100% to our operations. That leaves you with, of course, the tax receipts. And when you're asking to be funded out of the tax receipts, you need to um, kind of wait into the mix and, and fight it out with everyone else who would like to be funded out of the tax receipts. You're going to need hip waiters. Yeah, do what you got to do. Yeah, no, that is true, although I will say that other states have had a clear designation, you know, from the tax receipts for the research part that has been kind of standard. California, in their new program, has just designated two large pots of money from the um, from the taxes raised for professional marijuana. One goes to sustaining the UCSD program. The other is kind of undifferentiated, but it's a pot, uh, again, a pot. It's always $10 million. I don't know why that's the magic number, but it's always that. We get ours, too. I just want to comment. I, th I, I like this proposal. I think it's probably the most fully baked proposal that we have today. Um, and then my, my just recommendation is that we probably work on the structure a little bit, on eliciting the structure uh, a little bit more to put into the report. And then, I guess for funding, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't have any experience lobbying in front of legislative bodies, but I would say that we just put the money that it would cost to operate the center, or how much it would cost to start it up, and we leave it up to the legislative body to debate on how they would fund it. I mean, maybe we do put a recommendation that we use, you know, the tax money to fund it, but leave it as general as possible and let them kind of debate it. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say exactly that, too, that the amount that we need um, is different than where the legislature knows full well where money in the state comes from. I mean, it comes from general fund, right? So taxes, you know, for operating income, it comes from uh, fees, other funds, it comes from, for, you know, grants, etc. So I'm not sure we need to tell them okay. which pot of money. Ooh, um, so other than the amount that we need, because again, back to the hip waiters, you know, spending a lot of time discussing, oh, you could fund it out of here versus there, and then suddenly, how does this rank compared to education for kids or whatever, you know, whoever else might need funding out of that? I, I don't think we want to go there. I think we want to talk about how much we need, what the, you know, what the barriers, et cetera, and, and not where, okay. the, where, where the funds would come from. That's easier. Hey, this is Pat. I'm trying to follow along. Could you tell me which attachment on Shannon's email that we're reviewing? Draft. Yes, it's called the Draft Legislative Proposal for Research. And there were three emails. Oh, there were three emails. So you might not be looking at the right one. Yeah, it came in the, in the first email. 
It was in one of those several emails you received today. Thank you. I'll look. Thank you. While it may not be necessary to, you know, advise on where the money could come from, I, I'm still in favor of recommending that it might come from tax receipts from REC. It, it makes sense. It feels good. It, it's what's right. Um, and so I think coming from our commission, I, I would want to be clear that we do have sort of an expectation that some of that money goes into research. Um, whether they, you know, take our advice or not and implement that, that's up to them. But I think I, I would feel good about our work if we made it clear where we would like to see some of that money coming from. And the appealing thing about that is that there's precedent in other states, you know, so it, it doesn't feel like as out of the blue. So. If they can, if they can skim the tax revenue for an illegal marijuana enforcement fund, they certainly should be able to skim it a bit for Amen. research. Sorry, that wasn't for the record. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. Any other comments? So, uh, does the chair think that there's going to be any particular, we're going to meet with any particular barriers, uh, vesting it in one of the schools um, with respect to federal funding? What's the, what's the plan there? So we had on the call at our last subcommittee, um, Peter Bar Gillespie, um, who's the Vice President of Research and Development at OHSU. He's relatively new in the role, um, but we brought him in um, specifically to comment on whether such a center would be feasible given the traditional concerns about um, its impact on federal funding. And then Dr. Roberts was also here to just talk about whether that he sort of got the sense that there was any institutional barrier because of that reason. Um, so both of them expressed a lot of enthusiasm for housing such a center there um, and felt that um, felt that the, the time feels right, that, uh, that institutionally it would be aligned with its bigger goals and that nobody wants to halt research in this area or walk from that. Um, I had a little, uh, Cindy Sagers, who's in a uh, similar position at OSU, was not able to join us, but I did have a brief conversation um, with her explaining why we wanted her here. Um, the quick answer I got was there, um, that they would both be um, excited about, you know, sort of maybe co-directing such a center, um, but also that there would be about, you know, 75 conversations that would need to happen successfully in order for them to overcome some of the traditional fears about this kind of research and its impact on their federal funding, which is obviously um, critically important to them right now. Um, they don't want to put any of it in jeopardy. So, um, so, from, so there, there's kind of a range, um, but definitely I felt um, with a lot of openness and excitement about it. So that's, that's why I was a little bit vague with the structure, um, is actually I just wanted to make sure that we had institutional buy-in and a comment about feasibility before we were too specific about how it might be structured and a lot of like sort of potential might that goes with that sort of language. <laughs> yes, I think yeah, we're a little overdue for a break. So five minute break and we'll come back and reconvene. Thank you. All right, let's come back to order. And I just wanted to, I feel like Pat, I know you finally got a chance to read over the research proposal. Do you have any additional comments? Uh, well, nothing profound, but thank you for letting me know there was a second and third email this morning. I would just say that I think it's a thoughtful piece and it's well written. I'm, I like the fact that it would create the center. Um, I'm not sure about the dollar issues. And is 10 million the right number? I don't know. Or three years? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not convinced that that's our decision. Um, and little micro, um, little micromanagement part under the goals on item C. Further down, it talks about having a balanced center um, in the oversight section, but then there are other areas that talk about the benefits. And I think it's probably better to say something like medical effects and adverse effects, something like that. So we're not appearing to be um, biased in one direction or the other, um, but that's sort of a wordsmithing issue. That's under the goals, item C, in the observational studies area. Um, that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful and true. I totally agree. Yeah, I missed that, but it's so um, it's so obvious when you point it out that that's a change that needs to happen. Okay, so why don't we move on? Um, I'm actually going to um, skip over to the budget just because I think we're so eager to hear that from Carol. So why don't I turn that uh, over to you? 
The way our budgets work is, is we we do have a biennial budget. It's uh, you know at the beginning of the biennium you have the cash rollover that becomes your beginning balance, and then uh, you create projections based on uh, data, you know historical data, how many patients, how many you know how many patients pay full price, how many pay at a reduced fee, uh, your growers um, and um, very, you know, historically we had dispensary and processor revenue that uh, actually added to the program. Um, and those items become your budget. Then each month as you get the actuals that come in, so we run, um, the budget runs from 7-1 of um, 17 through uh, 6-30 of 19. That's the way that the budget system works. So then every month, after, as the uh, actuals come in, we re-forecast with the actuals for the month plus the um, re-forecasted um, projection through the first year, and then the second year is still a total forecast. So this projection is actuals through March, so you will have three more months that are, uh, to have three months in the first year of the biennium of uh, projections but actuals through March um, we have seen a steady decrease as everybody has been um, talking about in our patient volume in our you know our application volume in going down um, we've seen just data wise more of the revenue going down in the full price the $200 payment and the increase in the uh, discounted prices. So I would say probably in December of last year, we started to see uh, the first time in history for us where our reduced price fees was 51% and 49% for full price. So we're definitely seeing that trend. Again, a great survey to find out why. We all have, we all have questions that we would like to have answered is that partially uh, People can have cannabis now legally. You know, is that part of it? Is that is it access or is it costs? All of those things. So, um, so that's a little bit on how this is broken out. So, if you'll see our uh, general fund, we receive um, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a biennium, and that is new. That started in this. Uh, in the, it was passed in the two thousand seventeen legislative session when they created the commission and that was to pay for half of Shannon and then to pay for half of an OPA-3 to assist with the commission. Um, so that's what that dollar amount is. Um, and then the rest of our money is all other fund. Um, as Katrina was alluding to earlier, the different funding sources that the state has. You either have general fund, you have other fund, or you have federal funds. We are not a federally funded program, we're an other fund program. So the, the basis of our revenue is all through fees, which is considered another fund. Um, in the patient revenue, uh, you'll see that our projections in 18 are much higher than in 19. And again, um, it's because we've taken the same forecast of that reduction. We have no idea. I mean, you're, pre you're predicting the future, obviously, and it's very difficult. You're looking at the trends and you're looking at what has been happening and um, at one point we thought the trend would be to stabilize and by uh, the time we started this biennium that we would be pretty well stable. That hasn't happened. So, you know, the program is in a state of flux as we're all aware. So our uh, FY19 forecast for the revenue for patients is taking into account that the revenue um, you know, the revenue for the fees, uh, reduced price fees is going up, so that means your revenue is gonna go down as well. And then also uh, looking at um, taking a, a, a reduction each month um, on that too. Um, grower revenue um, has a very steep decline in 19. And again, um, it's taken into account um, the growers that are either uh, leaving to leaving the system or uh, or a majority of our growers are patients that grow for themselves um, and more people are moving to that model more 
and that does not have a gross site fee if they're growing at their own residence and such. So it, it takes into account that uh, aspect that that revenue is going down. When you see the metric revenue, that's a pass-through fee. Uh, that was projected before um, all of the changes that happened in uh, 1544 and uh, you know at that point we thought we would have about 3880 I believe is the number uh, that we thought would need, need to be using the cannabis tracking system and that at that point was a price on every grower. Initially we thought every grower had to pay that price um, and we actually got the fee at the gross site level so it reduced the cost for our our growers by having it at the gross site. So whatever that dollar amount is, 100% of that is transferred over to OLCC, and that those funds are used to pay for metric. Neither OLCC nor OHA has an administrative cost on that that is strictly um, to utilize the metric system. So you'll see that there's no revenue in, and then down below you'll see revenue transfer. So it's just it's considered a pass-through fee. Uh, the revenue for the dispensaries and processors, we, um, we have negative. Um, basically, uh, most of our dispensary revenue and processing revenue, um, have, most of them have moved over to OLCC. So we've had instances where we've had to reimburse applications, and so you'll see a negative because of that. Do you have any questions on revenue? So next parts, uh, so it's less ca allocated cost to OHA and PhD. Those are administrative costs of uh, being in a state agency. Uh, they can include rent, facilities, uh, telephone, uh, computer access. It's all of your shared services for both OHA and OLCC. Every grant um, in the state pays their portion of those costs, whether you're federal or other fund or uh, federal or other fund pays those costs. So those, those are the two uh, costs there. And then you'll see the metric revenue transfer out, so the money going back out. Um, the next line is the state support for public health transfers out. That is a legislative action. Um, this last biennium, they reduced it from, uh, we, in, in the year, in the biennium for, uh, we supported a higher number than that. It was about 18 million that went to, to fund other um, programs. These are legislative decisions as to um, programs that they felt needed to be funded and utilized the marijuana funds for that. Um, it was reduced this biennium, so we have 7.1 or 7.2 that is um, funding one program, which is state support for public health. Um, that gives us our net revenue, and obviously uh, for 19, it is uh, much reduced revenue because the uh, the beginning balance is included in the uh, 18s. So yes, that's one reason why you see such a difference in funds. Um, personal services is what it costs to run the program. Uh, we have. Um, Filled position, we have 44 filled positions. We actually have 53 uh, positions in the program and have chosen not to fill some of these to reduce costs as much as possible. Uh, we have had some uh, legislative um, uh, actions that have reduced or will be reducing some of our um, positions uh, in the upcoming uh, months, actually. Um, in the uh, legislative session ending 7117, uh, there were 16 positions removed from our budget. Uh, it was the compliance unit and the majority of the analysis unit, other than a research analyst and an economist. Um, we worked then with the legislature. They made that decision based on um, the thought that the majority of growers would be moving over to OLCC and so our uh, when you do a revenue reduction you have to balance it within the budget so um, we did make that reduction um, and then we've requested additional staff back um, and have gotten permission to uh, fill some of those positions 
and um, have gotten permission to uh, work towards uh, filling some of the compliance staff in a limited duration position for till the end of the biennium. That's not finalized yet, but we are working on that. Um, and uh, so that's the personal services part. The rest, the OIS direct charges, that's the cost to have uh, staff that assist us with maintaining our databases and data systems and um, uh, all of the, you know, all the changes that are needed. Each legislative session that we have done or created the patient online and created the grower um, compliance and the processing side of uh, staff that are direct charged to us. We, at this point, will end uh, with approximately $3 million, but, you know, as you go then um, and start the biennium again, you're looking at a, almost a $2.8 million less uh, at the beginning balance. So, as you continue throughout the, the next biennium, um, you know, the revenue will, will, the balance will end up much less and most likely not positive. Questions? So I'm just missing some math here. So the projected cash, cash balance at the end of fiscal year 18 uh, is 4.5 million, and then the beginning fund balance for fiscal year 19 is 3.1. Yeah. Interesting. She has that number wrong. So um, I will have to find out because that's a huge difference. Um, yeah. I I will have to let you know that. Yeah. Jeff Gins for the record. So I, I copy that you said you lost 16 compliance officers for this biennium? No, 16 positions. How many compliance officers and how many are you asking for to come back that are compliance officers? So um, the compliance, we, we lost the whole program initially for uh, the compliance staff, which was the manager and uh, five compliance specialists and the other compliance specialists that go with them. And then coming back, uh, we were authorized to have three compliance specialists. Okay, thank you. Um, Carol, do we have any idea how many um, growers, OMMP growers, actually moved to OLCC? Not off the top of my head, but we can find out for you. Okay, thank you. Because there has been a lot of projections on based on every, but all these growers moving to OLCC, but I'm not finding that to be the case. A lot of growers stayed, most of the growers stayed with OMMP from what I've been able to pull, looking at those statistics. I think at one point you had mentioned that there was about almost 600 that had actually moved inventory over from OMMP to OHA, I'm sorry, OHA to OLCC. I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, so I'll get that for you. Okay. And can we get the numbers or um, the breakdown of which discounted prices people are using? You know, we have several buckets. It would be good to have to see which areas are the... I, I the will, that are yeah, we have a... Yeah, I'll get the statistical snapshot for you guys that has the um, numbers, the breakdown. Just a quick look look at the April statistics. 49% uh, no reduced fee eligibility, 7% for SNAP, 24% for OHP, 6% for SSI, and 14% for VETS. Yeah, and then we'll just need to be able to compare that to other years to see which buckets are growing faster than yeah. others. Well, in 2012, there were 60% there were, in 2012, there were 60% not eligible, 32 on SNAP, 2% OHP, 6% SSI, and nothing for VETS because they didn't have a reduce any of them. That's one population that has increased a lot with the reduced fee for VETS and then um, allowing uh, for a VET that's 100% disabled to not, after they've gone to the doctor once, um, to not have to go back to the position that we've seen that population steady increase. And it's like the fourth, fourth largest category of people that have signed up. It's about 5,400 people or something like that. 
how does this make you feel in terms of, I mean, part of your patient access subcommittee was addressing, you know, are there expanded ways people could qualify for reduced fees? I'm just looking at this budget, make you feel any different? Um, no, I'm still very nervous about it all. And uh, being able to keep funding the program off of the fees is going to be going to get harder and harder unless we start doing ramping up outreach and So, as someone who also works with a fee-funded program, there are two other ways to deal with the shortage, cut program and raise fees. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how we haven't really found a third dimension to that yet. So, is, is there any of this that, I guess, what more do we need to know so that we can advocate for the sustainability of this program? Because this is looking pretty grim to me. How do we, you know, I mean, we, we hope that some of the things that we're talking about will kick in as far as outreach and just like public awareness, strengthening the program um, while still increasing access to patients. Um, but is there more information we need or just simply looking at this, does this make any of you feel like there, you know, there's something concrete we need to include in our legislative recommendations to um, increase the financial health of this program? Yeah, I think we need to recommend for the taxes to be reallocated. I do. I mean, not that, again, not that they're going to acquiesce to that advice, but why isn't, why isn't that one of the line items? So I actually, um, I don't entirely agree. It's back to the comment I made earlier. I think it's really important to point it out. We are, this commission is supposed to be making uh, comments are important to the legislature, and I do think the financial um, uh, viability or whatever word you want to adapt that's important for them to know. But uh, again, back to what I said earlier, uh, they, they know where the money is, and so we don't necessarily have to say, therefore, you need to take money from retail, or therefore, you need to not allocate money, such and so on. But I, I do think it's important to, in this report, say, that one of the things, again, a barrier to a viable medical marijuana program is that cardholders are going down, funding is going down, and you either cut program, increase, you know, revenue, uh, funding from somewhere. So again, unless, and, and we had a little discussion, but especially those of us working for the state agency, if the governor's office wants to strongly say this would be the source of funding, et cetera, we work for the governor and those of us working for state agencies could get behind that, but otherwise I think it's important to point out what the barrier is, and I don't, I don't know that it's value added to say, and therefore we think you ought to allocate money from, you know. Yeah, and I wasn't thinking in that sense, more like, Everything that we've mentioned so far as a potential suggestion um, is at cost. Do you know what I mean? So it is, I guess it's a funny report if we say um, we would like these five programs, they will all cost this amount of money. Please find it for us. And by the way, um, the entire program um, looks like it's not, um, it's headed in a really difficult financials. I'm just wondering if there's any way to sort of balance our proposal so that it looks like, <laughs> you know, that we are. Well, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make recommendations that are. Or is that just, is that, do we just say, it's a tough sell, we leave it to you to figure those things out, or, we, or you know, are there, are there recommendations we can make that would um, uh, suggest potential efficiencies? Yeah, um, I mean, you know? maybe the report, in part, is that the program is at risk. I mean, in the report, it's, you know, the medical marijuana program, OMP, but here are a number of things, I mean, you know, it could even start off. The program is at risk because fewer cardholders and blah, blah, blah. Now, here in our report to you, there are different aspects you asked us to report on, and we're telling you yeah. about um, research, and we're telling you about, you know, patient data, et cetera. But the program, the funding is going down, and the program may not be viable. Financially, financially. That's a message that needs to go to them tomorrow, yeah, so frankly. And I, I, I know budgets and bienniums and all that sort of stuff are at play here, but this program is in serious risk of caving in on itself. we got to figure out how to stop it because we got 45,000 patients out there who need this program. If we don't come up with a solution, if we don't come up with some kind of path forward on this, this report in 2019 may be too late. 
I don't think we're in that dire of a situation, but I do think that long term we need to definitely be looking at it. We're not in a negative at the end of this biennium, but I do think we need to be working towards that solution. Well, I'm also concerned because of um, these 20 or these 2,000 some growth sites that are supposed to create growth site uh, administrators are shying away from it due to the cost. And we may be lucky if we get even half of those people to create a growth site administrator and come into the OLCC tracking, remaining with OHA, but come into the OLCC tracking. That's going to devastate the program. And we're going to know those numbers within the next 60 days. Are you meaning if they don't follow through and actually begin tracking? And yes. Yeah, if they, yeah. If they cut back to 12 plants or they fail from the program completely, which I've heard a number of longtime patient providers are doing, 2019 is going to be too late for this program. So, I mean, I see that the numbers, you know, 2019 is the number we really go into the red on, but if we don't get relief, um, from some of these costs, these growers are just not going to participate. They're going to drop out of the program except for growing six or 12 plants, and there's not going to be enough money to fund the program. And I think that's coming sooner rather than later. I can't stress it enough. The program is in serious trouble, even though it looks like we got four and a half million dollars this year, but next year's not looking so good. So between now and then, we got to come up with a, with a solution. Anthony, I want to bring this back a little bit um, to the statute. You know, we're, we're tasked with determining a possible framework for future governance, proper oversight and regulation. So all this talk about budget assumes that budgeting at current levels is the correct framework. And if you make that assumption uh, that the, the program as it stands today is the correct size and scope program, then yes, we have a budget problem. Um, but if we come up with a different determination about the size and scope of, of the program, um, the budget pro problem may look a lot different. That kind of leads into our next uh, agenda item, if you feel comfortable. Do you all feel comfortable moving on from the budget? That was super helpful information. Thank you, Carol. Um, so I'm going back to the thing that was originally before that. So um, I had put on this uh, a discussion of the structure of the OMMP. Um, and out of respect for all of your time and also to still save room for, um, for public comment, I actually suggest that um, we just take a moment to, uh, there's a kind of this report that's here that should be next in your packet that has this beautiful green cover. Um, so I just, I want you all to know that it's here. Um, this is kind of a summary for how the uh, medical marijuana program is structured in other states across the nation, um, including those with and without recreational programs, um, whether it's under a single agency or multiple agencies. Um, I actually would move that we defer a full review of this and conversation until the next meeting um, so we can really give it its due. Um, I would um, suggest that we, um, you know, to the extent that the size and scope of the program, as Jesse pointed out, um, relates to uh, this discussion of, of the framework of the program, that we include that in that discussion. Um, and that also all of you take a, um, a little bit of time to read this through. Um, and if there's additional information that would be helpful um, for that discussion to let Carol know yeah. um, so that we have the resources and information, the background, um, to have a really robust conversation. Does that sound okay? I feel like yeah, we just no, kind of to barely get into that. Okay, so that'll be, let's just uh, try to make a report in our next meeting. Thank you so much, and I love this report. Um, so let's move on to... Um, just a quick revisiting of the listening tour, just because that has always come up. Um, it's never quite been the right time, but I just wondered, um, maybe in the subcommittee meetings or um, another discussion we've had, has anybody had further thoughts about um, whether now would be the time to schedule a listening tour, if that would be helpful for any of our objectives? Um, I know we have a really packed schedule for the rest of the summer with our subcommittee meetings and our commission meetings and our agenda items. Um, 
I mean, it is. Without adding anything else, I'd say it's a really ambitious schedule for the rest of the summer. Um, but at the same time, the listening tour came up again and again as something that we all felt like was important at some point. I would be okay if, um, and I guess my personal preference would be to just really focus on getting to where we need to go for September, um, because this, this summer, as I march it through all our meetings, it's going to go back really fast, and we still have a lot of work to do um, to, to um, you know, to refine our thoughts into our report, the legislative proposal for the fall. I'm already feeling kind of nervous about it. Um, and then in the fall, we can sort of turn back to the, the list of when our time opens up, um, and we don't have that uh, the same like sort of punishing subcommittee schedule that we can turn back to listening to and really spend our time thinking about it, what we want to get out of it, and some meetings around the state. Um, but I would love to know if that's consensus in the group. I would think the fall would be the appropriate time to do it. And I would suggest that we incorporate at least one of, at least one of our commission meetings as part of it. So if we're going to go to Southern Oregon, let's just have a meeting down there and listen to the people. So maybe it's some, maybe rather than trying to do boom, boom, boom around the state, we do boom, space, boom. <laughs> and get it all done by the end of the year, and then that way we can report back to the legislature on some of the stuff and some of the feedback we've heard. I love that. Yeah. I think we should actually call it the boom space boom space boom. <laughs> tour. Tour. The listening tour. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we're agreed on that. So um, we. Why don't we end? Um, if there are no other comments from. I, I just had one other question with regard to just. Historically, with the OMMP since 1998 or inception, I mean, is there some document that you can show us how the program grew and what funding looked like and at its peak with uh, patients and then where we're at today? And because, I mean, the answer is going to lie somewhere in the middle there with what does what your staff look like, what are they tasked with, what's been shifted to OLCC, what recommendations might, might we make about the framework? So. I just, whatever you can provide us, it's probably on your website, but if you could bring something, uh, it'd help me. So are you, are you thinking uh, revenue, uh, staffing, the whole, get, get the whole, I, I will have to run that up, I uh, have to get approval to be able to put any of this out, so yeah, certainly can. I'm thinking revenue, staffing, and the number of patients, because to me, at some point in Oregon, we didn't have 47,000 patients and the, and the program had adequate funding and, and, and kept growing. Now we're going backwards and we hear the sky is falling and, and I don't know that it's falling or it isn't falling. So, Go ahead, Katrina. so just a very quick comment. I don't have the answer, but of course you're absolutely right. It grew and I think it had, its peak was 75,000 patients. But as I thank you, 78. <laughs> oh, four, four. Um, but as I alluded to a, a little while ago, it's very hard for us to talk about because initially there was a program where people were allowed to have growers and caregivers, but there were no dispensaries. Then there were dispensaries, so the whole process switched. And so some of the things, for example, initially it was a card program, we didn't have any compliance officers because there were, was nowhere to go check. So it's very hard to look at exactly that issue because so much has changed. It isn't just the number of patients that have changed, but what the program encompassed. And then, of course, there became retail sales, and people moved over, and then there's a whole laboratory. So every legislative session, something else got added, which meant that staff got added to do things. So even it might be right now, and I, I don't know this for sure, but the same number of staff for the current program, even though they're half the number of cardholders, because those staff need to do a number of things that were not initially when we only had a card program and didn't, um, you know, and caregivers and growers, but we didn't have any sales of the product. Uh, another comment I would make is that as we brought growers above board with our dispensary program, the OHA dispensary program, um, more and more growers were adding more and more patients and they were taking care of all the bills for the patients and providing them a pound and a half of cannabis every year. Um, but they are that number 78044 is really a misleading because a lot of these growers add more patients to get more product to go into market. And then when some of these growers jumped to OLCC, it left those patients hanging 
and they didn't. Then they had to absorb all the costs: cost of the car, cost of the doctor's office, cost of um, pro, um, gross site registration fees if they became their own grower at somebody else's um, address. So, just looking at the numbers as a whole it can be somewhat deceiving because that was a huge chunk of growers that they added over the course of about 15 months. Uh, and that's why we're seeing such a dramatic drop in a sense because, one, the pro program has just gotten really expensive for just a patient that it doesn't get any reduced fees and whose primary care physician won't sign off APS form. Um, but when these growers that were paying all the fees abandoned their patients, these patients were left holding the bag with no resources to pay for the doctor's fee or the card fee or anything else, and so they just stepped away from the program. So that's part of the reason cost is the other part. And then, of course, the ability of the growers to meet patient needs with the limited number of plants that they now are restricted to. So, Anthony, if, if growers were paying patients card fees and doctor fees in the past, why were they doing that? What's the incentive? Bottom line. They Wait. wanted patients. Patients um, didn't know where to get growers, so some of the clinics had patient or growers that they could put patients with, and so that was part of the process. And it really overinflated those numbers. Now some of the pay some of the growers are still paying all those fees for their patients, but it's getting tougher and tougher. If you've got a 16 patient growth, if you've got an eight patient growth site, 48 plants. That's sixteen hundred dollars in gross site registration fees right there. When you add the four hundred and eighty dollar metric fee, metric user fee, you add the cost of purchasing a certified state scale, and then all the other production costs that go along with it, these growers are rapidly becoming less and less incentivized to grow for patients. And the two prongs of this program were that patients could grow their own medicine, and if you couldn't, you could designate somebody else to do it and the the steps the state has taken over the last three years has almost decimated that grower community uh, and led us to the situation we're in right now where one, patients can't find growers anymore. That number has more than doubled over the last couple of years. And patient and the growers are unwilling to take on more patients because they have to pay more money. So some of the patients, some of the growers said to their patients, happy to keep growing for you, you have to designate yourself as your own grower at this growth site, so you have to pay the growth site registration fee and not me. So all of these things cascaded and left us where we're at right now with 45,000 patients. And that, I would add that that's probably a truer number of those Oregonians that are willing to opt into the program to get tax-free and medical-grade product but it is way short of the number of Oregonians that could actually qualify for this program, especially since we've added PTSD and pervasive and degenerative neurological conditions. And, and just to add a little uh, to that, um, the 30,000, or maybe it's 33,000, that who are no longer on the medical program, they might still be using cannabis, they're just buying it retail. Yeah. And again, the dollars and cents, depending on how much you use, um, looking at the cost of the card and the cost of all of these other things, it might be, and if you're not using that amount that is worth the tax deduction, it might be cheaper for you to be getting your medicine at, uh, you know, retail, even though you're paying the tax for it, you're not paying. So, so again, back, back, you asked a simple question that is incredibly, you know, on the face of it, it seems simple, but, um, so that's my guess, it's not that those 33,000 stopped using cannabis, but that that's it was true. That's cheaper actually, for them. Some of them are true. Cheaper, you know, I mean, we, we all do that, right? You look at, you know, the medicines that you buy, and you're like, well, overall, the cost would be cheaper here. I'm getting essentially the same medicine as, that, that I was before, so. But so they're some not getting the same medicine, yeah. and the prices are out of reach for most patients. So, um, so we have to address those issues. Um, I'll say a bunch of my Southern Oregon patients are no longer, you know, buying cannabis. They're not going to the retail shops down there and, and getting it. A lot of them have gone back on their prescription opiates, um, unfortunately. Um, and they still come in to see me because, well, they want to talk to me about using the cannabis the little bit they are, they are growing for themselves. Um, but a lot of patients are just giving up. I was just going to say, 
just wondering, Carol, I think this is kind of um, part of the project projections, but um, is it easy to get a little bit more fine-tuned data of what's happening with um, uh, registrants? Um, like I, I guess I, I know it's going down overall, but I would love to see the rate of change, the slope of the change, and whether it's leveling out at all, like whether it's quarter to quarter or month by month, and whether we could see that, and then also um, the breakdown by uh, by type of, um, of discount program, just to see yeah. where the, yeah, we can get that. That would be awesome. Just kind of um, nice to know how much to panic. So there's, the program puts out a quarterly fiscal snapshot every quarter. They're all online. <coughs> the most recent was April. Uh, and it gives you that breakdown. I mean, so I would encourage people to take a look at that first. If they don't get the information that they want, then maybe Carol can get her staff to get a little more specific on that data. We have it in other reports. I think okay. the trend report is not, that's a different report that um, might show that information. No as far numbers. as the curve. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, it definitely, I mean, either way you can see it, it's just what the trend report yeah, so shows it a little bit more by the five Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or even look or their links yeah. you can share. Yeah. Yeah. And well. I think you know, as Anthony was saying, uh, the numbers were very inflated. Um, so again, it is a difficult. You know, the, the high number that we have was an inflated number. Um, what are that reality is not too sure. Um, we could maybe look at uh, just such legalization. Um, you know, the program, as Katrina had said, you know, before that was a patient-centric program with just growers uh, upon, you know, 2015 is when the compliance unit, the analysis unit, so the processors' dispensaries were bought into our area. So maybe that analysis might give you just even um, sense legalization a difference. Yeah. Might be more apples to apples. I would also just add quickly that just like to add quickly that just because the number is going down does not mean less people using cannabis medically. In fact, exactly the opposite is true. They're staying away from the program. They want some anonymity, and uh, unfortunately, they're paying the price for it for products in, in the stores. If you buy a gram of RSO, for instance, it comes in a one gram syringe, one milliliter syringe, 50 to 60 bucks. You're using one of those a week. Going to put it out of the out of reach for you if you're on fixed income or low income. So a lot of patients are going back to their old um, sources for product and that's it's not a good thing. We need to make sure that our patients in this state are aware that they can grow for themselves and if they can't they can designate somebody else. And there's a lot of people in this state that can't grow cannabis because their lease says they can't or they're in government housing or they're just physically incapable so the really important part of this program is that leg that if you can't do it for yourself you can designate somebody else to do it for you and while I want to see the patient number grow I think we can do that without exploding the number of growers that we have in the system so um, we really have to stay focused that patient people Oregonians that are using cannabis as medicine is not a declining number only participation in program. We need to fix that. Okay, let's move on to public comments. Um, is there anybody on, calling in who wants to comment? I always feel like I neglected that opportunity. All right, otherwise we'll move on to the check-in list um, in order. And I'm going to hold you all to stick three, a strict three minutes just so we can get through everything on the list. So I'll start with Mike Rothman. Afternoon. Michael Rockland, up the record, um, cannabis nurse and advocate. Um, many changes, just like we heard Carol describe, have happened since legalization. In only two years, it seems like 10. Um, people say cannabis years are like dog years, so they are. Um, right now, retail is the main focus, has been the main focus with OLCC. Uh, the OMMP has been, like Anthony's described, um, pretty much decimated. Um, I think there was an expectation and, and the retail industry, at least one uh, pre group uh, OCBC admitted early last year they made a mistake in the lobbying that they were doing. Okay, so that fact itself when he, Don Morris said that in public, or at least at the meeting, told me that we were on the wrong track over a year ago. And so my concern is there's two major needs for funding right now. One is research at the top of the list because 
and I'm not talking about the full center, but just get some money, get some staff out there, at least staff to start working on this structure in a very um, aggressive manner, because we've lost two years essentially in the state. That's what really, really upsets me. Um, and the other thing is testing. I think uh, what Jesse said is really important, that we have uh, a robust uh, uh, quality assurance program for testing. And I think, I know at least one lab that's very, very credible in the state that could do that as a, as a contract lab. Um, and I think that's what we ought to move toward immediately, getting some funding for that. Uh, we've gone on too long. Um, we don't test for metals, and there's other quality assurance uh, issues I'm concerned for medical patients. So that's a real high priority. Now, as far as the medical program goes, um, that should be different from legal uh, adult use because uh, adult use is a consumer product. Uh, medicine is not, and therefore the the ways they're managed in terms of the product, product safety labeling, all that should be done differently. It's a higher standard. Um, I heard the use of the word grade, which is significant because when I was testifying the legislature, grade means purity and quality. It does not mean strength. And medical grade in the state has been misused to mean strength, and that needs to be changed immediately. The other thing is that uh, access, patient access is critical. Um, I agree with Dr. Rachel that um, there's a lot of patients fending for themselves, partly because of costs, if they're on fixed income, on the organ health plan, et cetera. They don't have a choice, and the policies right now are very uh, prohibitive because they're mixing, um, uh, not mixing, you can only go one or the other, opioids or cannabis. Therefore, you know, that's, that's what you get. One final comment, um, is that my time? They're playing you off okay. stage. Okay, that's my time. I'm ready to get off stage here, but, um, so that's really what I wanted to say. I think the funding is critical and some short-term needs are really paramount. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Duff? I'm Sarah Duff. I'm an owner of Duff Johnson Consulting. I consult with patients, growers, caregivers, clinics. Um, I've worked in five different clinics around Oregon. Um, so I'm going to try to make it to the training um, subcommittee because I think that would just be good information, but um, I wanted to give a little bit of information I was able to look up pretty easily, thanks to the stats that we keep for the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program. Uh, looks like in 2005 we had 12,000 patients. Um, at that time, the fee was only $100 um, or $20 if you got the reduced fee. In 2011, that's when we increased the fee up to 200 um, for the maximum um, application cost, and we had 39,000 patients at the time. And um, I have nothing but respect for Anthony Taylor. I just have a hard time believing that um, there's no way to sustain the program with less patients than we have now. I feel like we should be able to if we had 12,000 or even less than that. And if not, we need to do whatever we have to do to make that work. Um, I don't think increasing the cost makes sense. Um, back in 2012, when they increased the cost um, to 200, we had the highest um, fee, and I think we still do, um, for a registry program for medical marijuana anywhere in the nation. Um, the costs at the time were $25 up to 150 in any other state. Um, so I just feel like we um, maybe should think about decreasing the maximum cost of our um, application fee so that um, we could have more people participate. There are a lot of people that would be patients that just can't afford to um, be a participant any longer. I was one of those people for a few years, but uh, luckily I've been able to um, recently, and so I hope that continues. Um, but um, let's see, I also wanted to point out, um, I mentioned this in um, last Monday's subcommittee meeting for patient access, that um, we have a $4,000 dispensary license fee, and that is an insanely high cost. Um, that's why we don't have nonprofit dispensaries. If we could decrease that down, that would greatly help the, um, the possibility of having those. Um, I looked up the OLCC license fee for a brewery, and it looks to be $500, and a distillery is $100. How is it that we can't make our program less costly? Um, this is a non-toxic herbal remedy. I feel like um, it is important to train our bud tenders to not give medical advice. However, I feel like we should be giving them more tools to be able to offer 
science um, that maybe could be offered, since it is somewhat of an over-the-counter medicine that is now being bought by a lot of people that can't afford to be a patient and can't afford to go speak to a doctor. Um, but um, anyway, I just appreciate you all being here, and um, if I could be of any assistance in any way, I would love to help. Thank you. Thank you. Sunny Sanchez. I'm Sunny, and I've done this once before, but um, I am a grower in Lynn County and a resident of Benton County. And I am um, just want to say that I appreciate all of you coming here and taking the time to address um, the issues before the Cannabis Commission. And I uh, just want to say good job. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing the draft that you're, is that going to be made public? The draft that you present before the ledge? Okay. So, awesome. That's my comment. Thank you, Sunny. Missy Hoffer? Um, I'm Missy, and I'm here as a witness, as a medical patient using cannabis. I was diagnosed at 11, which was 30 years ago. It's a very rare brain tumor. A rare brain tumor. Um, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to sit here. No, I think Lower the mic, though. Do something there. there you go. <clears throat> And I've had countless numbers of surgeries and chemo and radiation and a variety of different things throughout my lifetime. And I would say that cannabis has helped to save me and it's also given me my quality of life back. And it's because my best friend is my personal grower who grows for me. I went from 30 medications to three. Now that has to be a big savings funding wise for the state of Oregon because I'm on Oregon Healthcare. And you know, um, if I didn't have my friend growing for me as my personal grower, I would not be able to go into a dispensary and say, I, because I'm using canvas to stop vomiting that no medication could ever control. I'd go to the hospital multiple times a year with vomiting that took hours and sometimes hospitalizations to get under control. My best friend growing for me, just by chance, this is a note to research, by chance I was having cannabis in place of my anti-nausea medication, which I had three or four different kinds, that never worked. And we started noticing the cannabis is controlling my vomiting. For a decade now, I have not been to the emergency room for hours upon hours and a ton of money spent trying to just stop vomiting. That's all. And the vomiting can lead to other things. Like I've had, I have bone issues. I have kidney failure. I've had kidney issues. I've had liver issues. I've just had a <laughs> number of multiple things. And without my personal grower growing for me, I wouldn't be off all of those medications. I wouldn't be avoiding surgery after surgery after surgery, which again is saving the state a ton of money. And I could not go into a dispensary because we do not have research developed to the point where I can say, I need something to stop my nausea. And we've also found something that stops headaches. And I, I've had headaches my whole life, and everything under the sun. And on when I was taking 30 medications, I had Vicodin, Gabapentin, Fentanyl, and uh, Flexerol in those 30 all at one time. I could have very easily overdosed. <laughs> I mean, just because you forget you've taken a pill. I mean, there's just so many aspects to having a personal grower who knows you, growing for you, able to test different plants and not restricted to a small number of plants where they can't even find out that there are these things to control the pain, control the nausea, and control the headaches. 
So I'm here as a patient saying the state will save a lot of money on, in the long run if they understand that giving people information about medicine, because most of our prescription medications lead to other problems and other issues and other diseases. And if you take a plant, I've, I mean, you can hear, I'm very clear. I couldn't have this conversation with you eight years ago. I was on way too much medication. I didn't have quality of life. So that's my comment, is I have a quality of life and I'm living at 41 years old and I attribute it. Plus, we were able to get rid of my tumor. And that's, that's the note. And I'm willing to speak to anybody and everybody who wants to speak to me about how we've come to where I've gotten. Thank you so much. Matthew Mendoza. Hello, my name is Matthew Mendoza. I'm a patient person for us. You have no nerves in front of people, pardon me. Um, I'm a grower for myself and I grow for one other patient. Um, I just have a grandfather's site due to House Bill 1157. I wasn't able to get to the workaround. They had a nice workaround where if I shuffled some paperwork and found somebody else to be my grower, then I could have kept my grandfather's site to continue on with my patients who are all on Social Security. Because I was unable to, that you know, workarounds, they're not, they can't be evenly applied to everybody. So as a result, I wasn't able uh, to continue growing for the other patients that are all on Social Security. I came down, gave testimony, when I had the opportunity to explain that hardship. And I asked simply for a little place, since I've already reported to him, on my dashboard in the Oregon Online Medical Marijuana um, System, to allow me to report cannabis transfers to my old patients. They can't afford it, they can't afford it at a rec store, they can't afford it anywhere. The, uh, the agency's response was beautiful and clear. It was, we need legislative change for that. So I've been waiting. I got really excited when everybody talked about these listening tours. No one's listening to us. So um, what I'm asking for, I want you to approach legislation and ask them to simply uh, allow us to report to each other in the system. Any OMP grower should be able to report transfers of cannabis to any participant, caregivers, growers, um, and patients. So I've been out collecting uh, signatures. I've been going to clinics and collecting signatures. And it says, Dear Oregon Cannabis Commission, I support legislative change that allows any registered OMP grower using Oregon Medical Marijuana Online System to report transfers to any registered OMP or participant. I have just under 100. Anybody would like to come look at these, I will be officially turning them in later. Um, when I find the appropriate channels. Um, and I'm going to collect them all year. I've designated three days a week uh, to go into clinics, and I'm going to be collecting signatures all year long. But I have just under 100. I have 96 signatures so far, and I've only been at it a week and a half. They're coming. Also, I did a little questionnaire, which agency you should administer, administer the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program, the OHA, Oregon Health Authority, OLCC, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, or other. Some people have been wonderful, the Department of uh, Human Services, I think that's... Some said the Department of Agriculture. No one has checked OLCC. None, nobody at this point has, wants to be governed by OLCC. <laughs> and then I'm almost done, I'm almost done here. Uh, and regarding fees, so that's $200 pro site fees I don't pay anymore into this program. My patients don't have a grower. They're on a, a social security. It's a funny, just like this woman said, we're friends and family. We're down to single growers growing for themselves or one other people. That's what the statistics show. We're friends and families of these people. Let us transfer to them. And uh, OLCC now can grow for unlimited amount of patients. Their producers can grow for unlimited amount of uh, patients. That's wonderful. No one stepped up, but when they do, OLCC 
those producers should be paying into the OMP program the $200 fees that I do. I, I mean, if we need money, boy, there's going to be a big source of it if everybody gets their way and we turn it all over to OLCC. Shannon, you're wrong. I was at the, 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 the I was, I was, I was there. I was at the, I was at the, at the rules advisory committee. There was an absolutely unanimous agreement that this immature rates should should go. Well, that's not that's not what I was taking. Okay, okay, all right. Well, I misunderstood you. That's what I interpreted you to say. Um, and I'm almost done. Oh, and finally, there's only 11 OMP dispensaries right now in the whole state. That's why I would guess that people are going into the OLCC shops. Um, we don't have anywhere to, to go, and I'm prevented to transferring cannabis to anybody. Of course, where are they going to go? They're going to go to a shop where you can just do it, right? So that's what I'm asking for. I'm asking that we be allowed to report our transfers into the online uh, reporting system. I hope that was clear. I'm sorry, I was really nervous. It was clear. Thank you. And I'll be here every one and every subcommittee meeting saying the same thing over and over. <laughs> and I'm going to keep bringing these patients with me, and I'm just going to bring more. So you have to imagine this room is at capacity right now with another 20 out in the hallway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Pete Kramer from uh, Mercy Center, Salem, Oregon. Um, I've been with the program for a few years, a couple of decades, or at least. I've seen a lot of changes happening. I've seen that we were being used as a cash cow for the health department. Um, seen a lot of changes. Fees, they're ridiculous. A lot of Patients are low-income patients, and they can't possibly come up with these fees. I talked to a friend of mine who was a lawyer, Brad Shipman, and he found that the state has been violating our constitutional right, Section 20. Everybody should be treated equally. I don't think the patients are being treated equally. When 91 was proposed and that, they said in writing, we would not touch the medical program. Look at what happened to the medical program. Growers had to sign out because of all the restrictions of fees. The patients can't grow for themselves, half of them. Um, I could grab and raise the arm, and all I could say is, I hope you do a better job than the right other organizations. We were asking for research about the cannabis, but we never got any information back. It was talking to a wall. Thank you for being here and that, and have fun and go fly a kite. That's <laughs> <laughs> a great way to end this meeting. Um, Sunny, did you have another comment? I just wanted, I didn't use, I did not, for the record, I did not use my three minutes. Uh, so, so I'm a strong supporter of the OMMP, and I would just like to leave you all with one thought and that is um, regarding recreational forces. I want to know if OLCC recreational forces are so compassionate, where are their medical bump up canopies for patients? Where? So please don't streamline patients into consumers and into recreational consumerism. Please do everything you can to preserve the OMMP program. Please. Thank you. Here, here. Please, here, here.
Thank you for all your comments. We really are listening. Uh, we have another one. Come on, come up forward.